Hey guys, glad to see you back on my channel. Today we are going to talk about my Super Adventure R motorcycle and its problem. Well, actually, here's what's going on. It won't start, it won't even try. Shows error messages on the screen. I tried for a very long time and of course drained the battery. Let's note the amount of fuel in the tank, it's almost empty. My first thought is that it's just run out of fuel. And this, I moved the bike to my house so that I could repair, not in a dark underground parking lot where repair is forbidden, but at my place where I have all the tools and where I can video everything for you. The story started when I pulled into the underground parking lot with the fuel reserve burning. Thought I'd fill up in the morning. It's 500 meters to the gas station. But the next morning I couldn't start the bike. Of course I figured it was just out of fuel or I had caught an airlock and that's why the engine wouldn't start. Brought some fuel from the gas station, but that didn't help. The repair should start with checking the fuses. I thought I had a blown fuse that protects the fuel pump. I checked all the fuses with a multimeter. It didn't matter if they were related to the fuel pump or not. All of the fuses were good. I decided to check the connector pins around and this is what I found. On it's the starter relay connector. The relay works fine, but the contacts are corroded. Somehow moisture must have gotten in here. I cleaned all the contacts. I used a contact cleaner that contains some kind of chemicals and oil. You don't have to blow it out after use. Since everything is fine here, I think I need to check the gas pump. I've seen cases on the internet where the fuel pump broke on these bikes and there was no pressure. But the fuel pump on this bike is under the plastic. You can't just reach it. I was pretty much 100% sure that the whole problem was in the fuel supply either pressure or an air jam that the fuel pump can't pump. It's very strange actually. Taking all the plastic apart and trying to get to the pump. There are a wide variety of bolts used in this bike. They are different lengths, diameters and slots that are used. There are bolts that have different size spacers for the plastic. Where it clamps two layers of plastic and where it clamps one layer of plastic. This has to be taken into account and it is advisable to somehow stack the bolts so that you can find and screw them back in afterwards. During the disassembly process, it became clear that it was impossible to get to the fuel pump without removing the protective cage. And this is where the maximum number of different bolts are used. From the top on the frame it is an ordinary Torx, from the bottom it is a Torx of a different size and a hexagon. Who came up with this design? You need a lot of tools to take it apart. Remove everything carefully so as not to scratch anything. The main thing to remember is that the upper fastening of the cage is not the longest bolt on this bike, but the middle one. The longest one is the one that bolts the tank. Here we are, finally getting to the gas pump itself. I disconnected the high pressure fuel line and saw that the fuel was there, so an air gap was out of the question. I honestly thought that the pump itself was not pumping. So I decided to connect the pressure gauge and see how much pressure it was giving. To do this, I just had to turn on the ignition on the bike. Only I didn't take into account that the pump 
if it pressurizes without dumping fuel, gives a pressure of more than 5 bar. Of course my pressure gauge went off the scale. But that's good, it means pressure is there, and there's no problem with the fuel supply. That's both good and bad, I was hoping it would be easy. Since I removed the plastic, I got access to the plugs, and the next thing I decided to check was spark. There was no spark, and the cause of that could be the crankshaft position sensor. The crankshaft position sensor is the only sensor on a motorcycle, like in a car, that determines whether or not there's spark. And the whole computer is based on it as the main sensor. And this sensor is not duplicated by anything. So if that sensor fails, the bike won't start. This sensor itself is located behind the left engine cover and its connector is closed by the tank. So you need to remove the tank. Before that, I had a previous generation super adventure. And there, removing the tank was a difficult task. This bike has a completely different tank, and a completely different plastic mount. I even felt like it was made easier. I was especially pleased that it is difficult to damage the plastic when removing it. In the previous version, the inner plastic sometimes broke. The tank is as if divided into two and hangs much lower. On the previous model, it was all the way on top. And by the way, this bolt right here is the longest bolt on this bike in the plastic and tank mount. The most interesting thing about this bike is that theoretically, you can remove only half of the tank. But the fuel neck is fixed on screw clamps, but the tank vent, which goes on top, on disposable clamps. So you can remove it, but you need to have new clamps on hand. I didn't have them, so I removed the whole tank. Well, this is another feature of the bike. The air ducts are fastened with screws, not bolts, and they are screwed into the plastic. They're two different sizes. But on the other hand, in all the plastic, this is the only place I've found that type of screw. So you won't be able to mess them up. If you look closely, just behind this panel is the power connectors for the optional equipment. Right there, just behind my hand. That's where you can connect the power supplies of your navigators and other gadgets. Do not forget to tighten the fuel taps. This is the line for the flow of fuel from one tank to another. If you do not tighten it, if you do not close these taps, fuel will start to leak out. Be careful. The tubes are secured with spring clamps. I've already disconnected them. It's pretty easy to do with pliers. The hoses come off easily, unless of course it's stuck there. You need to either turn the hose or push it with a screwdriver.
Do not forget to disconnect the wires from the gas pump and from the fuel gauge. I forgot while I was making the video, so I had to go back to it and disconnect everything. So be careful. Here you can clearly see the power supply for my navigator, connected to the power supply wires of additional equipment. Well, when everything is definitely disconnected, we remove the tank. This blue connector is the crankshaft sensor connector. There is a lot of different wiring and connectors around, but we need this blue one. I suppose water could have gotten into the connector and corroded it, so I tried to open it up first, see what condition it was in. But it turned out to be a completely clean connector. To avoid dirtying the other connectors, and in general to be able to see what's going on, it's worth washing everything. There really is a lot of dirt here. Look, this is the place on the engine cover where the white wires from the alternator come out. The red and green wires are the crankshaft position sensor. This sensor itself is deep inside under the cover. I wanted to connect to this sensor to see exactly what it was reading, so I used two regular needles to do this. I hooked them through the cable seals and I got them. I got to the connector pins. By the way, never pierce the wire insulation or the wires will rot. Start the bike and see what the oscilloscope shows. The oscilloscope shows nothing. Now let's check the resistance of this sensor. The sensor is now connected to the bike's ECU. So we're measuring the resistance together with the computer. And here we see 9.9 .9 kilo ohm, almost 10 kilo ohm of resistance. That's a bit much. Carefully take out the needles and look, even with such gentle use, the ceiling gaskets are a little bit jammed. That's not too bad, they'll be fine later. I think you should only do this in an exceptional case. Now we insert the needles directly into the connector of the sensor itself. I was interested to see what the oscilloscope will show just from the sensor. And there it is, just noise. It's more like some kind of alternator noise or something. I don't see any signal there for the computer to rely on. It's a new day! We're still taking the bike apart, because it's clear now that the sensor is really damaged. Something has happened to it. We need to take this whole thing apart and remove the engine cover. It's not a lot of work, just remove the oil filler neck, unscrew some bolts that hold the cover on, unscrew the clutch actuator, unscrew the cover that covers the chain, remove a few wires, and that's it. Well, at least that's what I thought at the time. There is a difference in the bolts, in the cover, so try to remember what you removed from where. They are a little different in length there. The clutch shouldn't be a problem, you've already changed the sprockets and chain 10 times, so we just take it apart. The only thing, immediately pay attention to how the wires were laid there, then they will need to be laid in the same way.
By the way, it seemed to me that if the motorcycle with a dry crankcase, there should be no oil in this cover, but I'll save you some time right away, there is oil in there. It leaks out when you unscrew that cap. So immediately remove the protection and everything else, because you still have to drain the oil. Well, of course, clean everything at once, because it is not good if any dirt gets inside the engine. Spend some amount of time on a sufficiently high quality cleaning of the entire space around. By the way, a lot of people use brake cleaner, but I found a more interesting thing called industrial cleaner. It vaporizes a little slower and cleans the dirt a little better. You can brush on the cleaning compound for a longer period of time. That's it, drain the oil as usual. Naturally, we pay attention to the filters with magnets, whether there are any extra shavings there and so on. This is absolutely standard oil change procedure, so just watch. Let me try to explain to you how to remove this engine cover. From the inside, on this cover is the stator from the alternator, coils. And on the motorcycle side, on the shaft, is a big rotor magnet. Looks like a neodymium rotor magnet. It's very strong actually. And it's very good at attracting the stator coils to the rotor. Also, on this cover itself, there's a couple of gears from the motorcycle starting system. So there are three gears from the starter. They have axles, which are inserted into this cover. The cover can only be removed by pulling it absolutely straight out. But because of the magnet, the cover is constantly trying to warp and jam. In order to remove this cover in the service, there is a special puller. It looks like a sleeve that is screwed into the thread in the middle of the cap. There the thread is covered by a plug. A long bolt is screwed into the bushing itself. It rests against the alternator rotor and pulls the cover more smoothly than by hand. I unscrewed the plug to see what was wrong with the threads. I didn't have a bushing, but I was afraid to just screw a bolt into it. I was afraid to cut the threads. Be careful, this cover is very easy to break. There are special places where you can rest your feet, but again, very, very carefully. In our country, the rain is a surprise. It can come anytime, so I had to take breaks and wait for it to stop raining again. That's it, the sun came out, and we could continue. When the lid has already started to move, the main task is to remove it as smoothly as possible, pulling it slightly towards you. It is held on only by the attraction of the stator to the rotor, but again, be careful. There, we've done it. Although, to be honest, I think that with a special device, all this would be much easier and faster. And most importantly, I would have spent less stress. Secure the cover so that it does not hang on the wires and get to the crankshaft position sensor. With the removal of the sensor, did not have any problems. 
and removing the sensor itself, visually, no damage I found. The only thing, it is very strange that not oil and gasoline resistant wires were used here. The insulation of the wires turned into plastic, the wires wouldn't bend, and I think the insulation might have burst. Since I was completely sure that the sensor was the problem, I had already bought a new one. Now I can safely compare their parameters and find out what resistance the new sensor should have had. The old sensor is in a break. Maybe of course if we put the device to measure mega ohms, we will see some resistance. But it should not be so. The sensor is broken, throw it away. We measure the resistance of the new sensor. It is significantly less than a kilo ohm. We change the range and see that the new sensor has a resistance of 103 ohms at 24 degrees Celsius. Not bad at all and quite different from the old one. Let's start assembling everything. According to the service manual, the screws of the sensor should be sealed with Loctite. That is a means against unscrewing the screws. Apparently, there's a lot of vibration there. Of course, when assembling I will use a torque wrench, because here with the correct torque should be clamped all the bolts on the sensor and the cover. Remove the old gasket, it's single use. We have a new one that was purchased with the sensor. I did not seal the whole gasket with hermetic sealant, but I additionally sealed the places through which the wires come out. Putting the cap on is the same thing. The cover tries to magnetize itself to the rotor and it twists. It is absolutely impossible to put it on. To make it easier for you, Put all the gears on the motor side, do not leave the cover side. The cover itself you must put on completely straight. I use the fact that I just measured with my fingers the gap that was left on the cover and in principle I did not have much trouble. But if you do not want to bother with this topic at all, simply either take a puller or screw a large bolt into the center hole of the cover. Turns out it's impossible to lay the cables the way they were laying until you remove the chain guard and this metal guide here. Carefully lay the cables as they lay and put everything back together. Of course, the cover will have to be tightened with a torque wrench. As always, crosswise and then have to check several times, because the cover presses the gasket and loosens the tightening of the bolts. Well, you all know that.
Since we got into the chain, then we will clean everything here to be clean and nice. The wiring in this place all attached to plastic ties, so I strongly advise you to restore everything as it was, so that the wires over time did not fray. Now we perform standard actions on oil change. Unscrew the plugs with magnets and screens, change the main oil filter. found some strange shavings on the magnet. Looks like it's from some sort of gear that broke off, but honestly, very alarming. On the other hand, it was the only other shavings I could find. I always so enjoy putting a new clean filter in the bike. There is something so beautiful about it. I use Silco Lane Oil. I honestly don't know, I don't like Motorex oil very much for some reason. After 5000 kilometers, the bike starts to run stiff and a little noisier than with new oil. Maybe that's the way it should be, but on Silco Lane, it goes somewhere around 8000 before the sound changes. After 8000 it starts to run noisier too, but I'm more satisfied with that. By the way, check out how much more convenient it is to fill oil into a bike that has everything and the tank and plastic removed. Once again, just in case, we measure the resistance of the sensor. We may have squeezed something somewhere, or something broke off. But in our case, everything is fine. Everything works. We assemble. And now, without the fuel pump, check the spark. You see, the spark appeared. So, you can now assemble everything and check on the assembled motorcycle. Alright, now we're going to speed up the video. Nothing new here.
check the high pressure fuel hose connector a few times. Sometimes it won't snap on, and it can just pop right off on your road. In this case, pressurized fuel starts flowing onto a hot engine. This is very dangerous, so double check. Don't forget to open the fuel leveling line tabs. If you do not do it, the pump will pump fuel only from the left tank. The fuel gauge will show half a tank, but no fuel will be pumped and the bike will stall. Be careful. First attempt to start the engine after repair. The bike stalled because the air bubble in the line got to the injectors, but we started up again and no problem. That's a win! We fixed the bike by ourselves, without a diagnostic computer, it wasn't very difficult, so I highly recommend doing it yourself. When you know that the bike is fine, it's more fun to assemble the rest of the plastic. That's it, the last couple of bolts on the guard and the bike is assembled. And now for a little trick on how to reset the service interval. You need to start the engine. It's so wonderful to hear the engine running. I've heard enough of trying to start. Go to the settings menu. Now press these two buttons for 10 seconds. We're going to go to the service settings. Here we can specify what the distance will be, what the mileage will be, where we want the warning to show, that the motorcycle needs to go to service and the date we want it to display. Use the arrows on the joystick to set the desired number of kilometers in time and then exit the menu. The bike will remember this and will no longer show you the service warning message. <laughs> 